Thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody. Um, I will indeed talk about the social value of elite sport, but I will also uh, put it in the context uh, of our split study and also repeat some of the slides you've seen yesterday to put this in, uh, in, in perspective. Um, and this is the book we published uh, about, it's now five, six years ago, um, the book on the first pilot study of SPLIS. And in this book, we started with the observation that uh, the power struggle between nations has uh, intensified. Uh, all actors do not really act autonomously, uh, but they do so in response to changes in the total configuration of nation states. So if one nation doubles its investments or uh, introduces full-time training uh, facilities, uh, new coach si uh, support system or new technologies, then rival nations uh, cannot or hardly lag behind if they still want to compete at the same level. And this has increased, led to an increasing number of countries that have adopted strategic, coordinated, nationally planned uh, elite sports system. And as a result, this was shown yesterday also, I think, of this global sporting arms race, national sport organizations and governments uh, throughout the world spent increasing uh, sums of money in elite sport. And our present split two study confirms this trend uh, until the present day. So over the last 10 years, Korea has raised its investments with over 140%. Australia, 69%. Canada, 65%. France, 61%. Japan, 57%. To mention only a few nations. Of all our sample nations, only Spain showed us drop in elite investments. And undoubtedly, this works. So our study again proves that the more countries invest, the more medals they win. This graph uh, refers to the Summer Olympic Games. Uh, so if the Winter Olympics Games would be included, then Korea would not be an outlier, uh, as this country invests much of its money uh, in winter sports, also resulting in a high position uh, at the Winter Olympics medal table. And this is an interesting graph as well, uh, because it shows that the results of the scores on Pillar 1, the investments on, in elite sport, uh, are highly related to their success uh, at both the Winter and the Olympic ga Summer Olympic Games. So the correlation of these variables is highly significant. And seen from this angle, it is true that more money in also means more medals out. But at the same time, there is also a return of investments, uh, a diminishing return of investments. So the more countries compete with higher investments, the, the more the price of success is raising. And the UK increased its investments substantially uh, and was also heavily successful in both Beijing and London. But it also had to conclude that the costs per medal uh, have, has doubled. Moreover, the investments do not pay off automatically, as Simon Shipley yesterday showed. So there are more and more countries um, uh, who do not win a gold medal. Uh, and 54% of all nations uh, participating at the Games in London did not win any medal at all. So I think it's, it's kind of zero sum game today. If one country wins more, medal, more medals, then another country will lose some. And that raises the question, of course, why countries aspire to win medals at the Olympics? And one answer could be, it's just sport. You know, it's just sport is about winning. Sport is it's just a fundamental characteristic of sport. And that's true, I think. But then the question still holds. I mean, why do then governments endorse the sport ambition to win medals at the Olympics? Uh, why, what does winning a medal actually mean for society and how and to what extent will society benefit from elite sport investments? 
These questions are seldomly empirically analyzed and answered. So we did not address it in our uh, uh, split study uh, either. In most countries, sport organizations and governments are looking for optimum strategies for delivering international uh, success in elite sports. Um, and we, as a split consortium, we and, and group, we have uh, focused in our split studies on the relationship between input and output, especially focusing on the black box that is what happens in the throughput phase. So what do countries do when they invest in sport to get an optimum result uh, as output? Uh, but in the near future, I think it will be of crucial importance to make a next step and add to this model um, a, a relationship between output and outcome. That is, the relationship between winning medals and public value. Why do nations invest in elite sport? Why do nations aspire to win medals? What positive outcomes does elite sport have? And these questions are of great interest and importance also, because in the end, the outcome, and not the output, will legitimize further investments in elite sport, especially if the price of the medal is, uh, will further raise. So if you realize how important these questions are, it's all the more striking, I think, that they have not yet, get, uh, not yet received the attention they deserve. Um, the late McGreen observed in 2004 that the simple question as to why governments invest in elite sport in the first place remains unanswered. And in a recent article on why governments invest in elite sport, Jonathan Griggs and uh, uh, Fiona Garmichael even go a step further. They say, sport is understood just as a good thing. And this is a discourse that has become almost evangelical. It's a belief that is hardly doubted or contested. It's just a given fact. Actually, uh, Barry Hulian and Green say that this discourse has, has gained so much power that it's almost impossible for governments not to espouse a commitment to elite sport. Well, as a research team in Splis, it's our, it's our ambition to put this on the agenda more prominently. So there are several claims of positive outcomes, several justifications, mainly in policy documents, but also in, uh, in scholarly literature. And these widely acclaimed broader social benefits of elite sport, uh, they need more robust research evidence. Um, and we have focused too much probably on the input and output and not yet on the outcome. And it's really something different. I mean, measuring outcome requires a completely different research design, also methodology. And it's also often highly complicated because uh, it's the contribution of elite sport to very complex societal issues and problems which are influenced also by many uh, policy strategies and social processes. And the outcome requires a different an analysis and cannot yet be measured uh, uh, by uh, the split methodology. Nonetheless, it's our aim to add this highly important theme. So it's here that I would like to discuss, just as a starting point of such a new step, uh, to explore the theme uh, uh, as a result uh, and based on uh, explorative literature study. In line with this study, I will focus this analysis on the question why countries invest in elite sport. So this is not about why nations organize big events like the Olympic Games. That's something quite different, I think. The answer will hardly address on economic impact studies of elite sport events, because the justification of, of winning medals mainly lies in wider social benefits uh, addressed in experiencing individual and team successes in major competitions. So what then are the main arguments and this also legitimation for investing further in elite sport um, and striving for medals? Although there are quite 
only a few empirical studies on the values and effects of elite sport uh, on society. Many policy documents suppose that these values are there. And in general, I think they can uh, they distinguish between three values. Uh, the inspirational value, which is about the elite sport success that would encourage participation rates, and indirectly, of course, then also leading to health benefits or social cohesion. A second value uh, distinguished is the identification value. It's about elite athletes as role models, instigating positive behavioral change or even also value change. Uh, also, elite athletes that could bolster national identity and indirectly social cohesion. And the promotional value, uh, that is that elite sport uh, would boost national pride and also give international prestige. And almost all these justifications uh, that you can find in the literature can be classified in one of these three value categories. And I will now discuss them one by one. So first, the uh, inspirational value. And it's absolutely true that elite sport attracts millions, even billions of people all over the world. And as such, it's evident that sport, elite sport, offers enjoyment and amusement. It's also clear that it enthuses and inspires people throughout the world. But what does that really mean? Does it also inspire people to take up sport, for example, and just encourage participation rates and physical activity? In academic literature, this is called the demonstration effect or the trickle-down effect. And if such an effect uh, does exist, elite sport investments will indirectly boost mass participation and thus be profitable for society at large. In addition to this trickle-down uh, effect, there is a trickle-up effect distinguished, and this effect assumes that a positive stimulating effect from sport for all will be on elite sport, uh, which is offering a legitimation for investing in sport for all, namely to reach elite sport objectives. So it, it's called both are combined, and, and they are called the double pyramid theory, although I would prefer not to speak about theory, because it's more a double pyramid assumption, I think. Um, and the assumption is that young tennis players are needed, a broad base of tennis players are needed to uh, lead, in the end, to a few uh, elite uh, tennis players and one Olympic champion. Uh, but also that this champion will inspire uh, people to take up uh, tennis and thus so to broaden the uh, base. And just to show you one example, uh, really uh, very suggestive and uh, you know, interesting example of this double pyramid assumption in sport policy, I would like to show you a small movie, which does not work. <laughs> Try it again. Can you read it? There it is. <laughs> to make an Olympic champion takes eight Olympic finalists. To make an Olympic finalist takes 80 Olympians. Make an Olympian takes 202 national champions. To make a national champion takes thousands of athletes. And to make an athlete takes millions of children around the world inspired to choose. Oh! 
really like this video. <laughs> it's so suggestive and also moving almost. And it's really convincing because you recognize the, the, how the, this child looks at the uh, television screens. And at the same time, you know, just as a scientist, I think, yeah, but does it really work this way? So it's really um, interesting to find out whether people are really inspired and how this inspiration works. And I think um, that uh, the, the way it wor works is uh, that the process uh, is of people, how people are inspired is uh, threefold. So first of all, by elite athletes who function as role models, but also uh, by elite performances that capture the public's imagination. And third, by elite sport events. There are different kind of categories that can inspire people. And there are also more forms of inspiration. First, an inspiration to take up sport in general. Someone who didn't participate in sport before, but then is inspired to take up sport. Or inspired to take up specific branch of sport. Seeing an athlete in swimming uh, inspires people to take up swimming, for example. Uh, the inspiration to adopt the sporting behavior of their sporting hero. For example, to be a midfielder or um, to have a certain kind of technique. Um, uh, and uh, finally, also an inspiration to adopt the behavioral behavior of, of elite athletes outside the world of sport. So for example, uh, the way you, you dress yourself or have your hair cut. Uh, etc. Um, and if this trickle down effect holds, then this effect would be very important for sport policy. Um, and in fact, there is also strong evidence that participation in sports has a strong impact on health. So if elite uh, sport would uh, help to improve sport for all, uh, that indirectly would also uh, help the. Uh, stimulate the health in society. But the crucial question is, of course, how this can be demonstrated empirically. And several studies have found at least a short-term increase in sport participation after big events. So for example, Phil and Frawley observed an increasing number of rugby players in Australia in the first two years after organizing the uh, 2003 World Cup. And in a Dutch study done by myself on uh, uh, several, uh, about 40 championships, I found uh, uh, an increase of judo players after the uh, successes of Anton Geesink, a Dutch judoka, who was the first non-Japanese judoka who won the world championships and uh, Olympic uh, gold medal in uh, Tokyo 1964. The increase after his success was bigger in the Netherlands than before his success and also bigger than in other countries. So some studies show that the trickle-down effect can occur under certain circumstances. Uh, but uh, a majority of studies uh, in which this relationship uh, was examined has come to opposite conclusions. So for example, Hogan and Norton, they did not find any relationship between Australian successes and sport participation. Uh, neither did Tuhu uh, uh, about the Australian swimming success at the Sydney Olympic Games. Uh, and in a Dutch context, beside the examples I mentioned earlier, I did not find trickle down effects in several big sporting uh, uh, events and championships. For example, Peter van den Hogeband and Inge de Belijn, two Dutch swimmers who won five gold medals at Sydney in 2000. Uh, and you can see here the trend in swimming club membership in the Netherlands, and you see there is no effect uh, at all. Or even worse, uh, the championship of the Dutch volleyball men's program in 1969, Atlanta, gold medal. But this gold medal was, I think, more produced by an earlier increase of volleyball players in the 1970s than that it had in itself a, a, a positive effect on club membership after 1996. Uh, which is not the case, as you can see here. And a profound uh, econometric study of uh, Feddersen confirmed that tennis successes of German uh, tennis players, Boris Becker and Steffi Graf, uh, between 1985 and 1992,
did not have a positive effect on sport participation levels in Germany. You see here the sport participation level in the tennis players uh, as percentage of the overall number of uh, sport participants in competition in Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, and you see that the success of Boris Becker and uh, Steffi Graf uh, did not result in a different trend than could be observed in the Netherlands, which had no uh, Olymp uh, Wimbledon champion until Richard Karajek won in 1996. And when Richard Karajek finally won as a first Dutchman the Wimbledon title, then after the title, the uh, membership of tennis players in the Netherlands also decreased. So, it's quite puzzling, uh, I think, uh, but um, uh, you have to conclude from this that uh, some others uh, see it as, uh, 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 can confirm this under certain, certain uh, conditions, but others see also a negative relationship and speak, for example, about a discouragement uh, effect. So, for example, that spectators realize how their own achievements in sports can never be compared to those of their heroes. There are positive effects to remain uh, shortly after the uh, shortly after the championships, um, and it's it's quite unclear whether the engagement uh, is maintained. And little is known about the conditions. And the conditions are, for example, uh, what is the influence of the type of achievement or the type of event, or uh, how important is it <coughs> to look at certain target groups, and what's the role of the sport organization. And how about the cultural meaning of sport, for example, the popularity of sport in a specific country? Or what is the impact of the symbolic meaning of athletes? And that brings me to the next uh, value, the uh, identification value. Many people do not only follow elite sports just out of interest for a particular sport, but also because they identify themselves to some extent with a specific team and or athletes. So this identification can originate from practicing the particular sport with the athlete as an ideal um, of achieving the highest possible level, but usually identification is based on social aspects like national regional representation or concerning gender or ethnicity or disability and so on. So this identification value offers another argument for public investments in elite sport. And the idea behind this argument is that identification with sport heroes and sport teams can contribute to the imitation of athletes we see as a role model. It can lead to a feeling of personal well-being and also of empowerment, and also pride with specific uh, groups. Um, and it's suggested that identification with elite athletes, uh, like national teams, can also bring people together, leading to integration or social cohesion. There is sufficient empirical support that people, and especially young people, identify themselves in very positive ways with, with, with uh, sporting heroes. And in general, people's identity development is also inspired by these idols. <coughs> and this is not only in sport, of course, also in music or uh, other fields of uh, society. Uh, and sporting heroes can become role models. Uh, and that can lead also to imitation. But there is also a lack of evidence about the question to what extent athletes actually uh, function as role models and to what extent sport fans do model their behavior after them. So do people also adopt moral behavioral qualities like fair play? Or do young people work harder and have more discipline because their hero shows these qualities? And do they also have uh, and copy non-desirable behavior like foul play of doping use or sexual harassment? Such questions cannot be fully answered on the basis of the present state-of-the-art study. Apart from qualitative statements like, I would be like him or her, uh, empirical support is lacking on the extent to which athletes really influence behavior in sports and everyday life. What we do know is that role models have a greater impact if they are more close to the recipients. So the person who identifies him or herself with the role model. So this role model would, for example, be the neighbor or the teacher or the 
train or a cousin, so someone who is quite nearby. That is all the more true if those values that underlie the behavior of these role models are also copied and shown and propagated by sporting heroes. In that case, the behavior of uh, a sporting hero is also positively valued uh, and at the same time also within reach. So a positive and powerful example in the daily environment, supported by exemplary behavior by a sporting hero, is most effective in bringing about behavioral changes. Globalization uh, has put pressure uh, on our national identity um, and has also strengthened the need for expression of we feelings and also shared emotions. Um, and I think elite sports provides especially that. So shared experiences and emotions, and especially at the national level. Um, sport competitions degenerate physical, physical gatherings of people in stadium or uh, uh, in the streets, pubs, at home, etc. And these feelings, uh, these gatherings bring about uh, uh, processes of shared experiences and also emotions and for collective consciousness of being the same uh, member of the same society. These experiences are also embodied by uh, several national symbols, uh, fan decorate their houses and their, their, their faces, etc. And that's, I think, more in sport and elite sport the case than in any other, uh, uh, other terrain, other uh, aspect of society. However, um, just for also here, it's quite difficult to really uh, find good data, real evidence that this leads also to national social bonding, to community cohesion. I think always it's easy to see it, 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 it has to work, it, it, it's, it's just so suggestive that it works, but it's so hard to prove. <coughs> Related to this is the claim that international sporting <coughs> success also contributes to uh, national pride. And this effect is also highly visible, visible in societies. International events and successes have become part of our historical uh, heritage, and especially in countries uh, that have used sport also to foster national identity and accompanying feelings of pride and solidarity. This is really the case. And the hypothesis is then that international sporting success contributes to national identification, national pride. We all see the flags, hear the national anthems, etc. However, again, I'm looking for empirical evidence. So do citizens of a country really become more proud because fellow citizens, fellow countrymen and women uh, have a feeling sporting a success? Or do sporting events just create a platform to reveal already existing feelings of national pride? There is a longitudinal study uh, has been carried out in the Netherlands between 2008 and 2010 uh, of changes uh, in the feelings of national pride and also cohesion around major sporting events that took place around that time. And feelings of national identification, pride and cohesion proved to be quite stable during this research period and did not or hardly uh, increase during Euro the European Championships of uh, 2008 and the Olympic Games that were held that year. Although you see a slight increase when the Dutch team reached the quarter-final uh, and was relatively successful at the European Cup, uh, Football Cup, and also a slight increase of uh, national pride uh, in, during the Olympic Games. But in the longer term, it's quite stable. And there's, of course, much historical evidence that elite sports um, can put states on the international map. So the other inspiration that is international prestige. I only need to say Berlin 1936 to give you a prime example of how elite sport can be used or misused if you like. Apparently, a promotional and also attributional value is connected to elite sport, no doubt about that. <coughs> If a country is successful in elite sport, 
This has an impact that surpasses the world of sport and improves its position in the international hierarchy uh, of uh, uh, world power. No better example probably than East Germany, successfully used elite sports to gain recognition. The medal table rankings increasingly functioned as barometers of that hierarchy. And this did not end with the Cold War. Even today, also today, this just continued. China, Australia, the UK, but I think almost every country, every country is inv invest heavily in elite sport also because of the symbolic meaning that are attached to the medal index. International sporting success just gives international prestige. But whether this has an effect on, for example, the number of tourist visits to a particular successful country, or taking this country as a place of business, or buying more things made in this country, that's just another question I think that cannot be answered yet. So, let me come to my conclusions. The literature study showed that there are many assumptions with respect to the societal values and that they are only still partly supported by empirical evidence. Much research needs to be done yet. We can learn two important lessons. Uh, the first one is that elite sport does not automatically have an impact. So sport participation is not an automatic legacy of winning medals nor does winning the Olympics automatically enhance national identity, pride, or prestige. Several su studies suggest that far more deliberate interventions are necessary in order to increase participation in sport and physical activity. So as Peter Donnelly concludes, concluded, inspiration is simply not enough. Secondly, <coughs> um, the impact of elite sport is contextual and conditional. So the effects depend on the social context, on the social conditions, and on the way also how sport is practiced and organized. We can control and influence these contexts and conditions. So that's, our main, that's a challenge for sport policy and sciences. How to create positive sit, uh, conditions so that uh, more positive effects come out of elite sport success. How to organize sport in such a way that the trickle down and trickle up effect can be expected. For example, there are indications that the trickle down effect is more likely in relatively new sports or well organized sports. It's also more likely to influence people who are already active than people who do not participate in sports. And following from this, what are the possible additional policy strategies and interventions that can lead towards increased sport participation. These conclusions are uh, supported by earlier findings. Um, for example, Henstedt and Skille showed that the growing popularity of biathlon in Norway after the Lillehammer Olympic Games, they resulted in, they, they resulted in an increase in sport participation. And why? Uh, they say, especially because there were promoting programs. Uh, they had a good <laughs> network of clubs. There were good facilities. There were coaches that supported these programs. So all kinds of conditions that are necessary in order to expect positive impact. The games in itself did not have an effect. No, it was the organizational strengths of the clubs. It was the quality of the coaches, the atmosphere at the playing field. That is important. So my final conclusion would be that we first should learn more about it. Uh, the more the country invests in elite sports, the more we need information about the outcome. And there is astonishing little evidence, and I think it's an obligation for both the governments and sport organizations and scientists to produce more knowledge about it. And the crucial uh, challenge in this respect will be to get more information about what happens right there. So the point where sport is copied, learned and practiced the point where people come together to play sport, the point where teachers and coaches can exert influence. That is the black box, the new black box, the throughput, if you wish, between output and outcome. And that is what my colleague Frank van Ekeren has called the moment of truth, where the societal impact of sport becomes real, can become real. So my suggestion is 
uh, let's join forces and let's investigate these moments of truth. Thank you very much. Marco, thank you very much for your clear presentation. Um, you talked, of course, from a research uh, point of view, and I have a question from a political point of view. And we talked about it yesterday, and uh, the question is actually, why do you think we always have to legitimize um, elite sports? Why not compare it to, for instance, ours? We invested in our country hundreds of million in our national museum. Just because we enjoy watching our Rembrandts and Van Goghs. Isn't sport the same? Well, you could say that uh, to believe it is, is just enough to invest in elite sports. Believe in, in, in positive research. But in the end, I think it will be increasingly difficult to keep it by that. I mean, to uh, if more and more money is needed, then you have to have further legitimations. And then you cannot say uh, and keep it with, uh, by refer referring to some beliefs in the valuable sport. And I think it's also a question of confidence. Do we really believe it or not? And if we believe it, why then not uh, put more uh, uh, effort in uh, really uh, finding out how to produce these efforts? Because it's not an automatic effect. So you need to know what are the mechanisms to produce these effects. And that's what I'm really calling for. So you say, for us as believers, it's evidently what we need to influence the non-believers. Easy to see, but hard to prove, but I think we need more proof. Okay, Mark, thank you very much. I have a bottle of Belgian chocolate. Thank you. Thank you.